We travel by canoe. I mean, it's what we do. I'm a member of a canoe family from my community. Um, long before we were traveling on tribal journeys and had really a formal canoe family, we were using our canoes uh, for community needs. So that might have been, uh, you know, for our salmon ceremonies or whatever it is, just the canoes had a life. Yeah, my name is uh, Tony Johnson. Uh, my tribal name is Nostio. It's my good fortune to have learned uh, to practice this art of the Columbia River of my Chinook ancestors. The life that you live in the canoe is, is rich in teaching. In a canoe, there are whole philosophies around how you interact with each other, what you do. And so this salute or raising of our paddles as we uh, come to another person's beach is really important. It's, it's full of meaning. And the truth is the installation, the way it is now seeing it uh, all together, uh, it just, it inspires that moment, that emotion of kind of coming around off of a corner and putting your paddles up and bringing your nose to someone else's beach. You know, this figurative canoe that we've made here is, you know, a canoe from our territory arriving here uh, at the Burke Museum and carrying the culture heroes of our mythology. You know, Tony and I have always been uh, inspired by canoes on the Columbia River. The Chinook people were some of the best canoers and canoe builders uh, on the Northwest Coast. And for me, uh, when I first got involved with uh, Chinook and art and got involved with the, the Chinook people and the tribes, I can remember going to certain ceremonies, for instance, the first salmon ceremony and watching the paddlers come up in the canoes with their paddles up in a salute. It was neat because we wanted to carve a monumental size, larger than life size paddles. And, uh, you know, there's always, well, do you carve them all in wood or how do you get to that finished project? And there's always different mediums and it's tough to get old growth cedar or in this case, a uh, traditional paddle on the Columbia River would have been carved in ash. Well, it's hard to get a nice straight piece of ash to carve an 11 foot tall paddle out of that you could then take a mold from. We decided to start looking at the alternative, you know, alternative means to cast these. And there's an outfit in Portland that can take a uh, carving that you do, and then they can put it in the, scan it in the computer, blow it up and 3D print it. Paddles are very fine and finely made. You know, they're very thin in the blades. They, there's, you know, all the wood's taken away that can be to allow them to, to still function. And so to be able to mount these paddles required them to have some additional thickness that we wouldn't carve into a paddle. It's, you know, that was to be used in the water. And it was really important to me that these paddles not lose their look of functioning paddles. The smallest of the, of the paddles, the three in the stern end of the canoe, are actually directly modeled from two paddles that we have in my family that are a couple of hundred years old uh, and maybe actually a little bit older than that. And those paddles uh, were women's paddles um, they're very small in size. And if you notice, there's a woman that's actually skipper in this canoe into the museum. Her name is Ioi, and she's a very important person in our myths, in our stories. The middle paddles are modeled after a style that we've just carried on making, but also that, is re that are really well represented in uh, both the teaching of our own elders and then also in collections as well that style is is very unique also to the columbia river uh, in the front the same uh, very classic style of chinook canoe paddle they're actually uh, modeled after a set of paddles that are associated with a canoe 
that came from uh, the Scarborough family on the North Shore at the mouth of the Columbia River, Columbia River. And so those paddles also have real life today. I mean, we make a lot of paddles of that type and they travel with us regularly. You know, we put the art in today and we've been watching it as we've been doing the installation. And it seems like every five minutes it's changing uh, from the way that the sun's hitting it. And so, you know, while I'm really excited to see it here today, I'm really excited to see it over the course of seasons and years. You know, the way that those paddles are placed was intentional in terms of the shadow that they cast um, from the sun. And that shadow for us is taking, you know, li literally there's one stroke a day as the sun rises and that shadow reaches out and the sun moves across the sky. It takes one long stroke every day. And, you know, there's a lot to say about that. It's really kind of meaningful to us. You know, this is a living culture. It's a culture that needs the strength of things like this to lift it up. You know, when we find things like this to, to bring strength to the community, to bring pride to the community, it's, it's just our pleasure. It was just an inspirational moment in my art career and me, you know, getting to participate and be actually, you know, given the honor or being allowed to practice this art. It was just something that really hit me home and, and something that just seemed appropriate for carving and for public display. The hardest part of deciding what imagery was going on that on the paddles for me um, was actually who gets left off, not who gets put on and really wanted a wide variety ultimately. And I think we did that. Um, in some cases, the individual paddles out there are just representative of one particular story. In some cases, they're representing a single moment. But the beauty of what's there is that all of the teaching of those stories is, is there. It's a reference point. People that live here on this land without any knowledge of this information are really missing a big part of, of what is, you know, makes this place its, itself. And my feeling, my interest in sharing these stories and my interest in sharing these teachings is that people will treat the place differently. You know, these Aboriginal lands of ours and the Aboriginal lands of our neighbors, you know, will be treated differently if people were to really understand these stories. I think it just creates a connection to a place that doesn't always exist in America. Many, many Americans just are able to move place to place and never feel a real connection or roots to the, to the place. And I think that leads to people's ability to abuse a place or not care about a place. I think one of the greatest things just for me is that, you know, that, you know, that Tony and I have had such a great friendship that has stayed together. We've stayed true to each other producing this artwork. And, you know, a lot of the art or all the art on the Northwest Coast was about bringing people together. It was about community. It was about teaching and learning, sharing and inspiring. And I think that, uh, you know, that's what, what I have got from my relationship with Tony and his people. And so that, in a sense, is as much to be celebrated as the art is. There was and has been a resurgence of Northwest Coast Indian art. So clearly there has been unbroken lines of art and artists, but we all know that this art, the art forms of the Northwest Coast were really reduced and um, were really suffering not too very long ago. You know, Adam and I and others have been kind of quietly working away down on the Columbia River in our Chinookan territory to keep this art alive, to revitalize this art form. And 
one of the things we've both struggled with but been really excited to be involved with is is giving this art places to live and thrive publicly for us being able to bring this Chinookan style art from the Columbia River here, along with all the teachings associated with it, um, is, is really exciting.